Imagine, it is 1987 and you are nine years old. If you are a Southern Sudanese boy from the Dinka tribe, you're probably out tending the longhorned cattle with the other boys from your village. Or you could be watching the goats or helping fetch water from the well. You have no electricity, no television, no shopping malls, and everyone speaks your language. You have rarely even visited your neighboring village. Imagine, in an instant, everything changes. Angry soldiers from northern Sudan sneak up the road into your little village of Biang, yelling war cries in Arabic. Your 20-year-old cousin John Chol quickly runs with you and 20 other boys into the woods. The soldiers stay behind. You are suddenly cut off from your family and the only world you know. You don't return to your family and your village for 18 years. You have become a lost boy, one of the thousands of lost boys of southern Sudan, a group experts say are the most badly war-traumatized children ever examined. Imagine again you were that boy. What would you do with your life? Gaibo Luom did not have to imagine anything. This was his life. It's a lot of emotions. Because more of us miss, miss the parent. You don't know where your parent is, and, and the parents don't know where the children is. And so it's a very big movement that time. You don't know where you eat and where you survive, but we make it. There are no Arab came attack us here, and they displace our, and they cut us with a relative, and we ran away with my children. Many child lose life on the way, and we move with guy up to Fanyindu. Under John Chol's supervision, Guy and the other boys walked for several weeks from beyond through the bush, sleeping in the open, finding food and water where they could, avoiding strangers, until they arrived in a refugee camp just the other side of the border in Pinudo, Ethiopia. Guy lived with the other boys for four years in Ethiopia until they were forced to leave when the Ethiopian government changed hands. Once again, Guy walked through the bush for many weeks until they arrived hungry and exhausted in the northern Kenyan town of Lokichogio. Relief workers took them to the nearby refugee camp in Kakuma, where Guy and his friends lived for 10 years. In 2001, Guy became one of the approximately 3,800 lost boys who were allowed to resettle in the United States. He, along with five of his closest friends from his wandering life, found themselves on an airplane headed for Nashville, Tennessee. Life in the United States wasn't easy at first. Everything was different. But in 2005, 18 years after fleeing beyond, he was able to reunite with his surviving family members at the Kakuma refugee camp in northern Kenya. Yeah, it's a big emotion. Yeah. My dad did not recommend me because I am old and he's older too. <laughs> so we become somebody have to introduce to, to one another. So. At this point, Guy made a choice. He would return again to South Sudan as soon as he could to help his home village of Biang. My dream is that to bring the education to that children who are led by, by the empire uh, and be educated and have a good future through the Christian education. He also sought assistance for Biang in the United States from friends who connected him with Sudan Evangelical Alliance partners and their Africa director, Rosemary Kamati, 
who have built a thriving Christian school in the village of Boma in another part of southern Sudan. It was time for us to start thinking bigger than just Boma. And before we decided on the location, Guy and the proprietor of philanthropy fashions in the United States, a lady called Christina Martin, approached me and asked us if we could take up the Beyond project. And since we were already thinking of a second project in Southern Sudan, it was like God orchestrated us to move to Beyond. Guy, with the assistance of Sudan Evangelical Alliance partners, hopes to construct a permanent eight classroom school in Beyond within the next two years. Initial work has already started. Both Rosemary and Guy have found strong local allies within Beyond's thriving churches. Our main reason for doing whatever we are doing, education, what kind of education are we having? Education that will help these people move and have a relationship with Christ as their personal savior. So without the church on the ground, without us working with the church, it becomes very difficult for us to pass that message to the community. We need money to buy construction materials to build these classrooms. We will need school supplies like school desks for the kids. We will need school books, both exercise books and textbooks. We will need to pay the teachers. We will need eventually to build a library and storage for the school and a school administration block for the staff. Guy was ready to come back even before this project. And I just want our friends to know that Guy makes me proud and I'm sure he makes his community proud that he can come back, mix with his people and find ways and means of helping them to get an education for their children. This brings us back to our original question. If you were suddenly ripped out of your village when you were only nine years old, if you survived week after week walking in the bush frequently scared, if you were separated from your family for 18 years, and if you managed to make a safer, more comfortable life for yourself in a new country after all of this, what choice would you then make? I want to ask you to pray for the young people, and pray for Sudanese, and pray for the Sea Fatina, and pray for our staff, and help us to fund this project to be, to be fulfill our dream and my dream to help people beyond. Guy made a choice to return to help his people. Help Guy and Sudan Evangelical Alliance partners build a better life for the children of beyond, the children of a newly independent South Sudan. You can make this choice.